Welcome in, everybody, to the DNVR Rapids podcast. We are live from Studio B here at DNVR. Joining me today on the show, well, I should introduce myself, I guess, Mitchell Carroll underscore underscore Mitchell James on Twitter, Mitchell Carroll. You can find me here. With me today from Last Word on Sports, from Holding the Highline podcast, MLS Twitter superstar, Matt Pollard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, Mitch. Thanks for having me here. Uh, excited to talk about soccer. Obviously, a very disappointing double game week for the Pids this past weekend. Yes. Yes. Actually, you look a little warmer than the last time I saw you. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, we've been having some snow melt here in Denver and everything. Yes. So I decided to, you know, it's getting into the 70s. So I busted out the sleeves and to help, um, uh, HTHL is going to be recording later tonight. And I think one of the motifs of what we're going to be talking about is providing perspective and to not institute panic or anything so i'm wearing hthl's 2019 shirt which of course was referring to the bizarro season in which the rapids got two points from their first 13 games had three different head coaches it was absolute chaos and they still had a chance to make the playoffs on decision day so the rapids lost that season opener so of course uh just because that happens doesn't mean the team can't make the playoffs and Mm -hmm. the rapids in 2022 are much better set up than they were under against the then under the head coach who will not be named in 2019 yeah and and opened up last year with a draw and a loss and a loss to austin yes we yeah don't, we don't talk about that game no <laughs> no so i mean look obviously no one is no one's excited about the results no one's happy with the results but i think there's a lot to talk about i think there's a lot to look forward to um let's recap a little bit you and me were together in the frigid cold in the loss to communicaciones that was well brutal brutal is a very good word for that um you were the only person with a computer outside. <laughs> I yeah. don't know how it froze completely, but... Um, it's still working right it's here. Still here. <laughs> Plugs in, battery charges. <laughs> it was um, a game where I think if you replayed it 99 more times to get that 100-game sample, the Rapids probably put in three goals, 90 of those. Chances were all over the place. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, you have the, I thought the Rapids come out. I thought the energy was much better. I thought Robin Frazier did a better job in terms of setting up the lineup to be attacking. Was he a little bit too conservative in the first leg? Hindsight's twenty twenty. I'm not going to, you you know, you, that deflection goes over the bar in the 90th minute. And it's a nil-nil draw. I bite your arm off right now to go back and have that be the result. So, uh, but, you know, he sets it up. Max is in the midfield. Mark Anthony Kay's in the midfield. Lucas Estevez is much more energetic and they're grading chances. They're getting balls into the box. They're getting numbers into the box. You just, you didn't have any other conversion other than Max's goal in, I think, right around the half hour mark. But, you know, look, you get a red card 16 minutes into the game. Communicaciones is playing, you know, I would argue the majority, I would argue for a significant number of those players, that's the first time they'd seen snow yeah. in person. Yeah. I would, Juan Luis Anangano, the striker for them, who Robin Frazier looked at once upon a time when he was at Chivas, was the DP for Chicago. Maybe there was a game in Toronto when he was here sure. for two years. Sure, sure. He'd seen snow, but I, I think there's an argument to be made that in communicaciones just simply not wilting given the environmental conditions that they were in that you could argue that they wanted as much as the Rapids lost it. Mm -hmm. Um, But ultimately the Rapids didn't finish their chances. And when you're up a man for 75 minutes in an environment you're familiar with and the opponent isn't, you don't really have any excuses to not get that second goal. No, no, honestly none. And like, you know, there's plenty of excuses with guys coming in, you know, it was, they had only been with the team maybe 10 days by the second leg and, And, you know, I still think the team is gelling in terms of that, but there's a lot of holdovers. You know, obviously there was extensions signed. There's the core of the team is still here. Absolutely could have got a goal. Even if it was out of a set piece, they had a lot of corners. I don't have the number in front of me. They had plenty of chances. And, you know, I think we're going to look back on that. You know, I don't think, I think in the grand scheme, looking back at it, missed out on CCL isn't going to haunt the team in any way, but it was just a bad loss that you would like back. Yeah, I feel like I feel like supporters absolutely have a right to be aggrieved. Uh, MLS is a better caliber league than um, the first division in Guatemala. And then obviously, you know, we've looked at it. We've seen where at the we've seen, you know, if you go back to like, I think it was 2011 when there was still the group stage and everything. Gary Smith at the time was still very much focusing on league play. But in the preview presser that we had through CONCACAF, um, Robin Frazier was asked how they're taking it. And he said very seriously. Oh, yeah. He mentioned that a lot. 
yeah, so he took it seriously, or at least he said he did. The players did. I think the players deserve the most criticism for the yes. failure this past Wednesday. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, they tried to. I think there's an argument maybe to be made that, you know, could they, with the visa situation, have gotten Max into the team sooner to where he maybe. starts both legs? Yep. Um, obviously, there's that DP striker situation, which still hasn't been resolved. And we'll talk about fans that. are going to yep. harp on that. But I think that's kind of a, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to make out a fix-all solution for this team right now when there's a number of things that haven't gone well in their first three games but ultimately they said they were taking it seriously they played a team they were better at and they lost like you said it's not going to define their season I don't think the Rapids were winning CCL I don't think they were beating NYCFC in the second leg but we've seen fans particularly longtime fans of this team feel right to be aggrieved in yeah. that they've had opportunities in CCL and have underperformed even now when they've said that they're taking it seriously well and imagine if that loss in on Thanksgiving day in the playoffs last year was a one to nil loss where Portland scored in the, you know, whatever, 32nd minute. And it wasn't this heartbreaker end to a game that they were dominating in a season where they pull off the one seed and you're left with that in your mouth and then you lose to a Guatemalan team. It, it makes a lot of sense to be frustrated. But I also think you nailed it with a tweet in the last week or so where you were like, look, having a DP9 doesn't, like, they should have won that game. Like, you can say, oh, we need a DP9. Oh, we need a DP9. That's not, that's not, what was missing there like yeah i mean yes what could we improve the strikers yes of course like you can say that for almost every team but that doesn't like they had all the chances in the world how many crosses bounced in front like of in front of no one how many yeah. bad touch bad first touches in the in the finishing third and i just think formationally and lineup wise with who fraser switched out and starting max and i think he's made some really good calls there it's going to sound crazy. I kind of like a little, like you can't say you like what you've seen because they've lost, but like there's, there's good things to pull out of that. I think yes. there's some guys have played really well. I think Lucas has been a fantastic start to the season. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, maybe the best player on the team so far. Lucas Estevez so far yeah. through three games, I would argue. Yes. Yeah. Um, they've been, he's been playing that, that vines back role that, you know, that you guys like to call it. I think that's, um, a really, and you know, we did talk a little bit about the outside backs uh, in an interview we'll be playing later. Um, there's things to like, and I think LAFC score result is there's not much to like out of LAFC. I do think there's a lot to like out of CCL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and look, at the end of the day, you know, Neymar scores the winning penalty to win the first ever gold medal for Brazil at the Maracanã. It's one of the best. It's the best non World Cup moment in Brazilian soccer history. England loses at home, at Wembley and penalties, it's one of the most painful moments for three Lions fans ever. So, you know, penalties are a crapshoot. Again, I don't think it should have been there and everything. Nope. But, you know, there are a number of things that the Rapids could have done differently, independent of who the striker was or striker signings that happened that should have gotten this result. And in that, fans are right to be upset about it. If nothing else, the Rapids got an extra 180 minutes under their legs to get closer to be hashtag strength at altitude by yep. the time we get to the meat of the season. And not just that. I mean, look, obviously there's still the cup, but the schedule's opened up a lot. And if they're serious about taking this roster to a playoff spot, which I do think should still be the expectation regardless of how they've looked, then I don't, I'm, I, I don't know. I think that... I don't think I think you can almost wipe away LAFC after that CCL performance. Yeah, I think the like uh, let's not even think about that right now. We are going to talk about that, but like this roster is capable. Period. Yes. And Jonathan Lewis, the penalty he took off of the crossbar and back down, which was a mirror of the penalty that had just missed. <laughs> yes. Ninety seconds before, like literally the exact same penalty from Kremas. Uh, like I said. You could redo that game a million times, even if it's into penalties. The Rapids probably win a bunch of those too. Like yeah. it's just the luck of the draw, and and I don't know. I think this is probably the last major discussion we'll have over CCL because we'll have a little more meat of the schedule coming up. But they can focus now on the MLS season for the next couple months. And you, you guys, you know, the expectations are still playoffs. This roster is set up for it. No distractions. No CCL distractions. Mm -hmm. No extra tape you have to watch. No. You know, weird matchup where you got to fly internationally. It is now MLS time. Yep. Period. Fair? Fair. Fair. And on that note, let's get to MLS. <laughs> and let's go into the season opener at LAFC where Vela just laid waste 
to the Colorado Rapids? I mean, I, again, I hate to—you kind of referenced it maybe a minute or two ago of just the— the team's number one at Bank of California Stadium. Nope. They've historically gotten blown out at Bank of California yes. Stadium. They normally don't start well at that. Nope. LAFC, with what they have, their midfield, the distribu- distri- distribution they have with Sifu, with their center backs as well. I'd include now the former Colorado Rapid, Kellen Acosta, who had a good game Very over good game. the weekend as well. This isn't a team that you can chase the game against. And so it was like the, okay, you know, nine players who started on Wednesday are starting this game on Saturday. Let's see how they look. You know, they looked okay for the, about the first 15, 20 minutes for me. They were playing back and forth. Lucas was getting forward. They were getting the ball in the good areas. Still didn't really have any ideas once they got there. But, you know, they were, you know, it was a balance of play. I I wouldn't say that LAFC was, you know, was running roughshod over them. They weren't, you know, bunkering and countering, and it wasn't a siege mentality. And then Lal Sububakar slides in to try and cut down that angle against Kellen Acosta, and his hand goes up, and it goes into a penalty, and it's like, okay, Vela scores this. I know how this is going to go. Yep. I won't be surprised. Like, make it less worse than 3-0. Yeah. And so as soon as it was like that, again, I wasn't really surprised. I can't really be disappointed in the performance just because you saw how much they put into CCL and how leggy they were and. You go back and you look at the stats, a team on full week's rest versus a team playing their third game in 10 days on the road in MLS, like, it's almost as, it's FC Cincinnati Cincinnati at Atlanta bad oh, in yeah. terms of those stats. So, again, I think you ever, anytime you lose 3-0, you have a right to be disappointed, but given how much effort they had to put in for CCL, I wasn't surprised at all. I mean, there's a reason that they were plus 400 going into that game to win, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was a long shot from the start. And it's not like, you know, like in May, they have a stretch where they play um, in Kansas City, home for Seattle, and then uh, home for Nashville in 10 days, Mm -hmm. right? That Seattle to Nashville is so much different than that zero degree in the snow CCL match to LAFC opener. That is like... Yes, it's short rest. Yes, it's the the three games in 10 days things, but that was a dramatic turnaround. That is a tough turnaround in tough conditions. So what can we take away from that? Um, You know, we have our outside backs, I think, are playing extremely well. Mm -hmm. Um, The defense, which I know sounds crazy, has been a relative strong suit. Relative. Maybe not in the LAFC game. I think in the aggregate. You like what you see. Maybe not from Lawless. There's, there's a hole there. Yeah, he's, um, he was at, at yeah. his best. He's a crazy chaos merchant. And yes. at his worst, he's a crazy chaos merchant. Yes. And, and we got the worst version of that. And unfortunately, if you look at the the if you look at the defender who makes the mistake that kind of starts the, you know, the quicksand against LAFC, it has been Lawless. He made the mistake in the game at the bank last year that would have led to the opening goal. I believe Vela scored that. And then he also had the mistake that I think Vela had an assist that would have been on decision day 2019, that loss eliminating the Rapids from playoffs and everything. So the the Bank of California Stadium is the house of horrors for the Colorado Rapids. And then specifically, like it is like the deepest level of saw for for Lawless. (laughs) You know who I thought were actually really impressed? And our our friend Wanners from C38 noted it. Uh, Mosquito, I thought, had a great game. I mean, I thought I thought he the game was over for me by the time he Fair. came on. I mean, he had some good energy, and I yeah. think you you compare that to where I don't think that the substitutes were enough in the second leg against CCL. I mean, he comes on, he's Mister Energy and everything. He'll do whatever you ask him yep. to do. Um, he's not the person that I'm pointing at in film study this week. Sure. Going back at that game, uh, I thought Barrios has been pretty good so far. I had mean, his he, moments. Had his moments. I mean, you know, again, we're pulling from from tough games it's it's you know you got to find you got to find things that you think are working well i like what i've seen so far from barrios this season um i think he was he was okay in the first leg i think the the play that individually for me sticks out in the second leg of ccl was that breakaway he had yep. i think around the 80th minute or something and he kind of takes too long of a touch and then moscoso the goalkeeper for kramas comes out and is able to get it but i mean i think it's I think we're starting to learn that Barrios can be set up very easily to have success, but I think unfortunately when it's set up for the opponent to put numbers in behind and put eight or nine, ten men, eight or nine men behind the ball, it's hard for him to then find those spaces. So, I mean, you know, I say him, Lucas, and then to a lesser extent, not as a criticism of them, Kay and Max have gotten the ball into good areas and tried to do stuff with it. He, Barrios hasn't had the final product 
but neither is Lewis, neither is Rubio, and they've had more chances yeah. to actually score than Barrios has. Max, for as and and you know, he was playing down in front of where we were in the press box in that second leg. Instantly, I saw him looking for space. I, I liked what I saw immediately, impact wise. Almost not necessarily the opposite against LAFC, but there is going to be an MLS learning curve for him. Yeah, there's an MLS learning curve, and I think you also compare to where Comunicaciones is coming in and certainly being more defensive. And, I mean, LAFC's midfield, I think, is one of the best in MLS. Sifu's been absolutely fantastic. They added Ilya Sanchez to replace at the loss of Atuesta. And then you had Kellen Acosta, and Kellen Acosta, who is Mr. Salty, I will avenge myself against you and everything. Like, I just... That game was such a trap game. I think yep. it was, uh, you know, yep, the, yep, the yep. C38 podcast called it the double revenge game because you had Kellen against his former team who traded him when he didn't want to be traded and he was clearly upset about that. Yeah, he was ready to resign. Yeah, and then you had, um, and then you had the um, the fact that LAFC playing the team that eliminated them from the playoffs last year. Like, just there were so many things about this game where it was almost a scheduled loss for the Rapids. And again, you can be disappointed at the result, you can be disappointed at the performance and everything, but just there's so many things where just a full week of rest, everybody clearing their head, not thinking about CCL, let's fix up a few things defensively, let's focus on being a little bit sharper on set pieces to where I'm expecting just such a better 90-minute performance on Saturday. It's going to, I, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. I think you can expect a better looking squad for sure. 10 game or sorry. Yeah. Three games in 10 days is tough for anyone, especially a team coming out of the off season, playing in weird conditions, playing out of the country and then in freezing cold. You're right. They've had time. They've been at home. They have a nice stretch where they can just get into their training routine. The guys can get into the locker room. The new guys can really ingratiate themselves into the culture of the team and you know you especially like bringing in a guy like brian acosta Mm -hmm. who has intangibles that may not always show out in in games where you're losing three nil right like sometimes you might seem he's a little disappeared but he's been through all the battles he's been through mls and international and having him in the locker room is definitely going to be a positive and i think times like this is where that that will help come through yeah and I think the other thing for me, Mitch, I think the certainly uh, Jack Price said it in the post game availability after the game, saying that it was a little bit that the two nil score line at halftime flattered them a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely, it was a penalty on the first goal, but on the second goal, there's a question where you have C. Fuentes and then Max Alves fighting for the ball, and whether or not there's a foul there. I tend to think that it wasn't. There's people in the Rapids community who think that it was. Oh, yeah. I submitted a pool reporter question, <laughs> and um, the way it was described to me was that the positioning closest to the ball and then Sifu kind of establishing possession before the point of contact was enough. It's a 50-50. It's certainly not enough to get worked up about. Yes. And then, you know. and then on top of that, you have the ball played, and I still have not seen either on any of the replays that MLS has posted on their social, on YouTube or anything, or on, from the actual broadcast that you have of the game, an angle that shows Vela from the time the ball is played and whether or not he is onside. Right. The best angle that we did have, Vela's in the in the, in the the shot, Danny Wilson, yeah, who's the like most Yeah, it's like from that back defender. corner, from like the right corner, yes. basically. So And you see him... Yeah, and I mean, the officials in the spot to make that play, to make that call on the real time, sometimes there's, we don't get the live shot that they're showing when there's a VAR review of what the actual VAR review is, and that hasn't been released so far to date, so I haven't seen anything that definitively says that he's on site. I do think that the call on the field at the time, both the non-foul between Cifuentes and Max, and then the call ultimately to not raise the flag when Vela goes in on goal as on side, but I think there are some valid questions of we could get a little bit more evidence. There's plenty of times another referee on another day calls that a foul or that somebody puts a flag up and then it's only one nil and maybe the result comes out to be a little bit different. That being said, gap control against Vela was abhorrent oh, in God. the first half. It and was you can't, tough to watch. Yeah, and you can't and you <laughs> you have to be a lot better. That being said, Vela, who normally starts on the wing for LAFC, was central in a 4-3-3. Joseph Martinez is going to be central. He likes to be a channel runner. He likes to find the gaps. He likes to find the half spaces. The film study that Robin Frazier has done this week on what went wrong against Carlos Vela will be a perfect instructive to take onto the field and ultimately try to be better against a very similar player in Joseph Martinez. Uh, So we got Dev, Dev Machine, the homie Devin. DMVR superstar dev machine C38 grill guy. I was at the game. Definitely looked offside to me from my angle. Well, you heard it here, folks. Dev said okay. it. Dev saw it. Give us back the goal now. Um, look, it's tough, but I don't think we were going to win the game either way. 
you move on, you learn what you can. You, this, like you said, use this as an opportunity to set yourself up against Atlanta. Yes. Like use it. Okay. Like you probably weren't going to win the game anyway. If you get that, maybe you do. Ifs and buts, right? Mm-hmm. Like game happened the way it happened. That's soccer. Yes. It's tough sometimes. And sometimes the calls don't go your way. Sometimes, I mean, that call, would it have killed me if they blew that whistle with Max? No, because that's, a, you've seen that whistle blown before, mm-hmm. but you've also seen it not blown and he didn't. So we got to move on. Yes. Yeah. If you're, if you're making a big stink about the, about the, about, you know, how the officials did, there were, there was, there was, by the 60th minute, there was nothing about that game that said to me that the Rapids deserved to win. Absolutely. So with that in mind, we're going to look ahead to the Atlanta game, but first... I got to speak with Keegan Rosenberry today. Keegan, who's had a pretty solid start to the season. I think the outside backs are probably the highlight so far of this roster. Um, we talked a little bit about the new guys, about the culture in the locker room, about you know being coached by Robin Frazier as a former defensive legend in the MLS. Um, you know, And I think this is a good intro for our DNVR fans, especially the guys who are trying to get into the Rapids along with us. Um, so go ahead and check it out. Yeah, yeah, I'll drop that. And then when we come back, we'll look forward to the home opener. All right, welcome in to DNVR Rapids. I'm joined here by Keegan Rosenberry, the right back for the Colorado Rapids. Keegan, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. My pleasure. Yeah, this is great. We're um, super excited to bring you into the coverage we're doing this year. Um, We really want to get to know you as a player, get to know the Rapids as a club, and kind of introduce DNVR to you guys. Um, So I think the biggest thing coming out of this offseason into the season is the extension that you signed. Um, signing on for another two years. The second time you've extended with the Rapids. Um, what is it? What can you speak to the culture of the team, culture of the Rapids of Denver that has made you want to stick around for so long? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's an exciting time to be part of the team. And that's, that's, you know, that's what stuck with me. Uh, you know, I came in a time in 2019 when we struggled for a bit and things were, were not that fun to be honest, but the improvement that we've shown since that time. And since Robin's got here, the players that we've brought in, you know, the style that we play, the, the success that we had last year, most recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's, it's, it's exciting to be a part of winning. Winning is always more fun. Obviously you always want to play, but um, you know, winning in general and being part of a winning culture is, is what every athlete wants. Yeah, of course. And, and you weren't the only rapid to sign an extension with Max signing an extension, the captain, of course, Jack Price signing an extension and, um, and Wilson also, um, how strong is the culture right now in this clubhouse, even with a little bit of roster turnover? Yeah, I think it is really strong. And that's something that we really um, rallied around last year and have for the past couple of years is having a, a good core core group of guys that, um, you know, want to play the right way, want to want to work hard, want to work for each other and um, and believe in the system and believe in the, the, the coaching and the staff. So, uh, you know, we're excited about that core sticking around for a couple more years and hopefully continue to build in a positive way. Yeah, and, and and part of building that, you brought in, um, I think, two really big additions in the offseason were the young guy in Max, who, you know, brings a lot of skill, but a lot of unknown. And then uh, Brian Acosta, obviously a veteran, both internationally and in the MLS. Um, I know that um, Mark Anthony K spoke highly of him coming in, and it's only been a few weeks, but um, has he provided sort of a leadership and, and kind of reinforced that culture so far in his time with the team? Yeah, uh, he's been an exciting player so far. Obviously, you know, from the outside looking in, haven't seen much from him yet. Uh, it's so early, but uh, you know, now trading with him for a couple of weeks and, and seeing what he can provide, I think everyone's excited to have him in the group. Um, he, he is more Spanish speaking than English speaking, so in terms of leadership, I think he does a lot of that by example, and that's another good way to lead, and, and we don't mind that. Um, but there's also a good Spanish contingent on the team that that I feel like he also feels comfortable with, so that's good. Um, uh, in the locker room, is it pretty, is it a pretty rowdy lo- locker room? Is it quiet? What's kind of the atmosphere in there right now? Um, I would say it's, a, it's always pretty, uh, high energy. It's always pretty positive. Um, you know, the, it's a group of guys where, uh, I feel like everyone is always, you know, giving each other shtick. You know, there's, there's no one that's off limits. There's uh, no one that accepts it poorly. And, uh, and I, and I've been fortunate to be a part of locker rooms that have always been like that. So. Uh, I think it's everybody keeps each other honest, and, and I think it's good in that way. Is there one guy sort of on the ox cord who's kind of leading that? Um, ox cord. I'll give Johnny Lewis a lot of credit. I, li- I like his uh, music choice. Andre Shinishiki's also uh, uh, very, very skilled with the ox cord. 
That's awesome. That's good to hear. That's it seems like you guys are in a good spot, even with um, you know, the rough start to the season after the Champions League and the and an LAFC. How do you go into this home opener kind of with those games in the rearview mirror of what's what's sort of the attitude right now looking at this home opener against Atlanta? Yeah, I mean, I think we're excited. We're excited to get back in our own building. Um, we're excited to to show what we're truly capable of because I don't think anyone would think that we have, have done that yet in the first three games that we've played. And uh, specifically, I think attacking-wise, uh, you know, I think obviously the second leg of the Champions League game, we had a lot of the ball, we were attacking, but but didn't finish as well as we wanted to. And then in L.A., we, we just didn't create enough. Uh, we did have some of the ball, but uh, end product wasn't there. And, uh, you know, I think if you look at the expected goals for that game, it was horrendous. So uh, especially coming home, um, it'll be another good test. It's a great team to play, but um, I think we have high expectations for ourselves in terms of generating chances and, and hopefully capitalizing on those chances. Yeah, and, you know, you guys have been allowed, you and, and Lucas especially, have been allowed to sort of play up and, and kind of work those wings um, sometimes even up past the midfield. Um, can you sort of speak to how Robin has entrusted the two of you guys to help kind of create the offense and still be able to come back and support that back line? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a difficult position. Uh, you know, I won't sugarcoat it, but, uh, one of the things that he's trusted us with is, is our ability to read the game and make the right decisions, attacking and defending, uh, you know, as the game flows and, and seeing what the game needs. So it's a very situational position to decide when to go, when to stay, um, you know, decisions to make with the ball, depending on where people are and, and, and more specifically who you're playing with. You know, if, if I have Mikey outside of me and uh, in another situation, I have Mark in the pocket when I turn and look forward, you know, those decisions are going to be different. Play Mark's feet, play Mikey in behind, um, you know, obviously based on the pressure that's shown as well. So uh, it's 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 continuing to, to work those relationships on the field. And it is early, but, um, you know, we, we need to we need to have a good response after last week. Um, when you are working with your coaches now, obviously Robin is, you know, up top and he kind of has to have the full scope of the team. How much does he work specifically with the defenders as a former defender in the MLS, as a former defender of the year? How much are you guys working with him specifically on skill set, system and all that? Um, yeah, it's, it's not, a uh, honed in, uh, maybe more so than anything else, but I think his knowledge and, and ability to read the game and, and see things as a defender helps us a lot too. So. Um, you know, maybe at times the center backs, but but also just uh, seeing the game from a def- defensive perspective. We focus a lot on defending as a team, you know, not just the back three, back five. Uh, you know, we defend from the front and and pressing as a team and, and reading cues and, and being dense and hard to break down is a lot of where our success came from last year. And, and that's what we're going to continue to do this year. Yeah, that was... Um... You know, it's probably tough coming off of that last year's success into how the playoffs went and then into how champions went. Is there that kind of bitter taste left over? Have you guys kind of put that in the rear view? Or is there something you guys want to kind of rectify from that? Or is this just new season, new crew, uh, kind of just working their way through it? Yeah, to be honest, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that that playoff loss is going to stick with a lot of guys until we win in the playoffs. And I, I know I, I feel that way. That was really really frustrating just because uh things set up so well for us to make a run and and that first half of that game we felt probably as in control of the game as we've ever felt and uh, again it came down to capitalizing on chances and i mean that first half we've got i don't know steve clark makes like three really good saves couple point blank i mean a uh, couple of block shots in the second half from defenders and um yeah, I mean, hopefully you can tell it's still very, very frustrating to think about. But, um, you know, wins in the playoffs are hard to come by, no matter if it is at home or not. And and that's what we're going to push for this year is to have another game first round at home and uh, and hopefully um, rectify that, like you said. Uh, at the same time, it is a new season, and we're not going to let it affect how we approach games, game in and game out. But it will be a motivating factor going forward. All right. Um, last couple questions. I just want to do some some quick hitters here, kind of let our fans get to know you a little bit better. Um, are you superstitious as a player? Do you have anything you do before games or in training that you have to do every day? Not really. Uh, I am very routine oriented, but I wouldn't say it's due to superstition. I just kind of like to be in a routine a lot of times. Do you do like the same pregame meal or anything like that? No, it's really more just like timing. You know, I like to eat three and a half, three hours, 45 minutes before the game, but what it is, no, not specifically. Uh, is there any weird superstitions in the locker room that you could share with us? 
Uh, our equipment guy pretty much likes to play the same playlist like at the exact same time when the players arrive to when the kickoff happens. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Any specific songs in there that you like? Uh, there's a there's actually a wide range. Uh, uh-huh. He tries to curate the playlist to our different cultures in the locker room. We've got a couple of English and uh, Scottish guys. We've got you know South American Latina corner and um, mm-hmm. some some guys like hip hop. Some guys you know a lot of different stuff. But he does a good job. Uh, what about you? What would be on your your game day playlist? Um, I enjoy the mix, but I would say anywhere from hip hop to um, like EDM house, chill house uh even even some of the you know the latino music like the urbano remix stuff is, is cool to me too awesome and then last one we'll do is uh what's your favorite uh spot to go out in denver mm, um i would say federalis oh nice 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 choice we love it Keegan local already Thank nice you. awesome well keegan thank you so much for joining us today thank you for joining us on dnvr rapids hopefully we can get you down here on the show, maybe here in the studio one time. I would love that. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me. Awesome. You have a great day and good luck this weekend. Thank you. You too. All right. Welcome back into DNVR Rapids here, live in Studio B, joined by Matt Pollard from Last Word on Sports and holding the high line. Uh, it was really good talking to Keegan, man. He is a great conversation. Um, I think he's a critical piece to this team's success. And um, I don't know. I, 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 Coming away from that, I feel like he's pretty confident going into the rest of the season. Yeah, no, Keegan's a down to earth guy. I think you're, you know, the, this team is filled with level headed. It's never as good as you think it's going. It's never as poor as you think it's going. And certainly, Keegan's one of those. Not necessarily the most vocal leader. He's more of a lead by example kind of a guy. But Grinder. I mean, you know, he's he's one of the guys who's going to help set the temperature. And the Rapids are going to be controlling the thermostat. There's there's urgency, but there is not panic going into Saturday. I really like how you put that. That is a fantastic urgency, but not not panic that is um well you know who does have a lot of panic right now would be the subreddit and rapids twitter (laughs) with the complete (laughs) lack of any striker talk um they dangle just a little bit of something which is not much it is a rumor of something that probably doesn't pay off this season but multiple irish sources reporting that dairy city striker michael harris is on his way to colorado on a multiple year deal he hasn't really broken into the first team in Ireland, so that take that for what you will. He did uh, score the winning penalty in like a local tournament there put on by EA Sports. Has a little bit of pedigree there. Um, anything to take away from that, or should we just put this on the back burner and wait? I mean, I think in general we should put it on the back burner, but I guess if you're wondering, folks, you know, by a number of metrics, the League of Ireland could be classified as semi-professional when you compare it to the rest of the leagues in Europe and you know look the this kid Michael Harris you know he supposedly had a bunch of trials with other clubs including Celtic so but you yeah. know there's uh, there's players on par with Trent Alexander Arnold who have come out of that and had similar trials there's players who are currently playing in non league for beer mm. money on the yeah, weekend bagging who have groceries had similar yeah. ones for that. That being said, it's an Irish player, Porrick Smith being from Ireland. He has lots of connections there. I assume any research that they need to do on the kid, any analytics based on the stats that they have, either from youth games or what he's done with the first team and everything, they've done that. I'm assuming that they've combed through any uh, character um, you know, assessments or what do former coaches, what do teammates past and present think of him and everything. Yeah. But you know, you're looking at a 19-year-old who hasn't broken into a league that I would say is below the USL championship. Absolutely. Might be a first team deal and then loan him to Rapids 2 or anything. So yeah. something to to keep an eye of. But I mean, this is this is not the DP striker you are looking for, Rapids Twitter. Yes, I was not presenting it as that, but you know, transactions are fun, people love them. There's something there. And I do think, you know, I do think there's some interesting names down at Rapids too, if this is where that ends up. I definitely think it's something to keep an eye on. You know, he's just under six feet tall. Um, Seems like he can finish from the penalty spot. Uh, I don't know. It feels like they did their due diligence, right? Like you don't make that deal with someone from a small club in a small country in a small league unless you see something there that, that fits with what you're trying to do with your roster. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm waiting until I hear something. I may, or, I may I may or may not have some birdies on the weekend that I may be speaking to. Okay. And then obviously, um, you know, there, there are many other outlets and yeah. reputable people who, from stateside who haven't reported on this. So I would say, absolutely. I, I think if we're, if we're rating this rumor in terms of it, I would put it like medium, but it, it is not sweltering and it's not smoking hot. Exactly. 
Um, what automatic F just say in the chat there? I don't know if your transfer window is still open, but I definitely go for what's he say? Who's it say? Krelich? Demir Krylech from Real Salt Lake. I do not believe RSL would be interested in transferring him. And I guess to answer the original question, the uh, primary transfer window for MLS is open through May 4th. There you go. I'm just saying, wait till July. That's I'm, That's been my answer every time we've gotten into transfer talk. This is the squad right now. Barring some bizarre opportunity coming out of left field. Moving on. We're done with, we're done with rumor talk. No more rumor talk. Uh, we're looking ahead. MLS home opener this weekend, 4 p.m. at Dick Sporting Goods Park. Atlanta United coming to town. They had a nice opener. Uh, they looked absolutely fantastic. Dom Dwyer getting a goal off of kind of their scrap heat and everything. Yeah. They've got some injuries going on. Um, Mitch, I'm going to read out. Uh, this is some reporting from okay. Doug Robertson from the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Very reputable person if you want to follow on Twitter for Atlanta United stuff. Shouts, but man, he shouts. had some uh, injury report stuff going on. Um, Brooks Lennon, probably okay. An outside back for them. Former RSL player. Yep. Um, they've got a couple people out. Scholl, who has a leg injury. Araujo has a hamstring. Um, and then uh, Emerson Heinemann has a is still on torn ACL recovery. Okay. And then their central midfielder, kind of, I would argue, their equivalent to Brian Acosta, possibly, though much younger. Um, Santiago Sosa is dealing with a visa issue, and they don't know whether or not that's going to get cleared in time. Okay. So he's questionable. They started a bunch of kids. One of them ended up scoring fantastic goal. And then they ended up, uh, Atlanta put out a video. They had, his family was in the crowd, and they had a camera on him. Oh, wow. So they saw him scoring, and then they, uh, like, timed that similarly with his family reacting and then them those two meeting up on oh the field God. after the game really good fantastic moment we saw that with Cole Bassett we saw that with Sam Vines etc yeah. so Atlanta's going to come here and they might have to play the kids and they're going to come here and be young and have energy does that mean that they're going to burn out and not have uh, not be 90 minutes fit at altitude does that mean that maybe there's going to be a little bit of naivete that a more veteran urgent but you know focused in the moment as opposed to you know young and bright-eyed that maybe the rapids are going to be able to take advantage of there's also not as much film of these guys that being said robin frazier does his due diligence i don't think there's going to be too much that we're going to see over no. the weekend that is going to surprise the rapids from what atlanta's doing you know the thing i took away from that opener that they had two goals from subs right yes. so late late goals um and while it obviously wasn't a great game against LAFC. They got most of those. I mean, it was 3-0 by the 60th minute, right? So it was, mm -hmm. it was whatever happened towards the end of the game, the defense settled in and didn't allow another goal. If you can hold for that 60 minutes, can the defense keep that form to the 90? And maybe they don't have those same scoring opportunities late mm -hmm. like they did against Kansas City. Um, this team is desperate for a, a goal, honestly, but a point. Three points is obviously the goal here, but the Rapids are going to be determined coming out here. Um, and you're right. There's a bunch of kids going up against a pretty seasoned group and a very cohesive group that has had, mm -hmm. that has a lot of minutes played together. Mm -hmm. Obviously Max is, you know, the wild card in there, Acosta, the wild card in there. Um, how do you see, what do you see as the critical matchup to look at? In terms field. of individual one v one situation, yeah, or <clears throat> position group to position group, like what are you when you're when we're up top at our perch at DSG this weekend? Where are your eyes going first? Um, I'd say the it's normally where they've played the young kids the most in the game against Kansas City was out wide. So then, what are they doing vis a vis the fullbacks for the Colorado Rapids or the wing backs if we're calling it a five man back line? And then also, what are they doing from an attacking standpoint? We've kind of seen in the first couple games, you know, Robin with the two up top, one of the one of those players has been splitting out wide. That's Diego Rubio. I see clearly that that's what they're doing. I don't understand the reasoning behind that. I didn't fully understand the decision to have Jonathan Lewis as a central forward. So are they tweaking something like that? But in any case, can they create space and can they create a numerical and overload advantage that in that I think Lucas Estevez again is going to be the catalyst for this team. Oh yeah. And if you can do that in a midfield that I think again is going to have another 90 minutes under their belt, look a little bit stronger. You know, Max has looked better in every single appearance Absol that he's had Absolutely. with the team. We'll see whether or not Brian Acosta starts then because you saw the, you know, the midfield advantage clearly I thought was slightly to LAFC's advantage. And then as the game kind of waned, the the 
timeline with the score the scored goals on Saturday was indicative of LAFC taking control in the midfield. If the Rapids are able to win that battle, then that will make the potential advantage they have on the wings more significant. And then I think that will ultimately, that'll just create a numbers advantage that I think eventually the ball's going to be have to sucked into the net with the XG that they're producing or opportunities on set pieces. One concern that I do have on set pieces, Miles Robinson, I'd say second to maybe only, um, I'd say Alexander Callens for NYCFC, and I'd say Walker Zimmerman for uh, Nashville are the only two that are better defensively on set pieces. So is Atlanta coming in with a zonal marking? Are they going man-to-man? And if so, who is uh, Robinson marking man-to-man? That's probably the that's the distinct area where I would say Atlanta has a position of strength, where the Rapids are looking to have a position of strength. Yeah, and, you know, they haven't converted. They've left so many set pieces, corner specifically so far, that look so close to finding what they're trying mm-hmm. to do. And obviously, uh, Jack Price is a surgeon on set pieces. So will one of those go through? We'll see. Mm-hmm. We'll see. I think, for me, the player I want to see really break out this game that I feel like has played solid, but Mark Anthony K. I I think he, mm-hmm. I think this is the game... He's at home. He's had a week. He, I mean, you were you were in that press press uh, press conference that he had before the initial CCF game. He called himself one of the best midfielders in the league, which is mm-hmm. probably a fair statement. Time to show it. This is the game. Home yeah. opener. Come out. <clears throat> set the tone in that midfield. Take control early. And man, if you can throw a goal in early, who knows? Who knows yeah. what goes from there? And but, the the one veteran that you have in the midfield for Atlanta is Ozzy Alonso, who is. I'm checking to see how old he is, um, who is 36 years old. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's been, I can't remember where he was. I think he was in Minnesota the last couple of years and everything. And so where's Ozzy Alonso's legs going to be in the 75th minute when oh, Jonathan Max, Lewis yeah. comes into this game? When he's, you know, Ozzy Alonso is like the, he's the dad driving a bus of all the teenage <laughs> homegrowns trying to corral them. And it worked against Sporting Kansas City. Is it going to work at altitude? Mm-hmm. And the other thing you brought up, Mitch, regarding set pieces and everything, Atlanta plays in the Eastern Conference. There's no altitude teams in the Eastern Conference Zero. Yeah. with COVID and everything we haven't had a lot of cross-conference play the last game atlanta played at altitude was in the first half of the 2019 season there are new players to mls who have not even experienced this in mls at all and then if you're talking about the physio guys where normally for those eastern conference teams they think about it the week before they're playing at rsl at colorado okay let's do a few things differently and then total knowledge dump as soon as that game's over Mm -hmm. so there's players who are dealing with that and the crosses are a little bit different. Jack Price has talked about it. I've spoken to Colorado Rapids goalkeepers who have mentioned it. The ball moves differently at altitude oh, yeah. than it does at sea level. Brad Guzon hasn't had to deal with that in two years. It's just that little bit of a difference where you were talking about, Mitch, where they're so close to going off to so where close. he misjudges it slightly <laughs> and Lal Sabubagar is able to smash that thing in the back of the net. Look, you're so like if this is the game where Max... The Max, Mac, Price, Estevez, we're going to see it click, right? And I think Devin just commented and Yaya threw it up and, you know, we missed it there, but here it is again. I hope they come out looking for more passes through and fewer crosses. And I think this is the game to take over through the midfield. Let Mac and Max really work it because the crosses were... Well, I, th- I think it was getting pretty frustrating to watch because it was cross, 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 yeah. cross, 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 and not much of a target in the middle. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, it's no disrespect to Diego Rubio. <laughs> he is under six feet tall. Yes, he's not Miles very Robinson big. is taller than him. Brad Guzon is taller yes. than him. So, you know, and I think certainly that was indicative, I think definitely against LAFC. And for sure, once they had the man advantage of just volume chances of let's just put it into the mixture and then eventually one of these is going to come up good. But if you look at it, Mitch, for me at least, and the XG proves this as well, the best opportunity the Rapids had was where uh, 
Estevez comes down. He combines with Max, and then it's Estevez who gets the shot at the top of the box. I believe goes off a, the face of an LAFC player, <laughs> and he gets reviewed for a concussion situation. So you know, I agree with you. And also, when you're doing something that's predictable that you know is a low chance of coming in, that just makes it so much easier to manage and anticipate that for the defenders. I think Rosenberry and Estevez coming in, and then particularly with Max and I wish I had like the Pep Guardiola like tactics board <laughs> and everything of yeah. just like the let's get. Uh, Max and K maybe five, seven yards from the top corner of the box, Please. whichever one of the wing backs is going forward and everything. And then instead of just putting a cross in from 20 yards out into the box and everything, mm-hmm. either cut inside, take it to the touchline or do some one, two situation with that midfielder. Mm-hmm. That is going, that's going to create a change in the phase of play that is going to make Atlanta. That's going to open up space. Atlanta's going to have to anticipate it. And then you have a chance to get something actually in on goal that led to the max opportunity opportunity um that led to i think the best chance for the rapids in the first leg of ccl for jonathan lewis as opposed to just lumping it in for diego rubio who can't be a fox in the box it's hard when both center backs and the goalkeeper are both six feet tall (laughs) yeah and and man estevez has been so good with the ball at his feet rosenberry has been consistent as all get out just sending a cross and just feels I, i don't know what the exact word i'm looking for here is but it just feels like it's not Like, work it a little more, right? Mm -hmm. Like, massage it out. Like, you have... There's creativity there. Like, you can go Estevez, Mac, Mac... It's too mechanical. Exactly. Like, find some creativity. Dude, Max, with the ball at his feet, is exciting. And we haven't seen enough of it. And he hasn't seen enough of it. Mm -hmm. Like, let him cook this game. Let him get in there and find Rubio on a through ball, right? And then, then, like, we've all seen Rubio finish that. Like, we... You know, yeah, he's not the DP9, but like, I know he can put the ball in the goal. You know, he can put the ball in the goal. Mm -hmm. So let's get through the midfield to that spot. And don't just rely on Estevez placing the perfect ball Mm -hmm. because that's what it's going to take. Yeah. Because you just don't have the targets that you've had. Like last year, at least in the second half, you can cross it into Badgie. It's Mm -hmm. not always going to be successful, but I mean, he scored enough goals that it's like, okay, that works. That's not going to work this time. I, I want to see that midfield breakout game more than any position group on the team. Yeah. Like, I mean, what else even is the candidate? I mean, besides Rubio netting a, you know, a brace or a hat trick, like. I'll take a Rubio hat trick right now. <laughs> let's go. Yeah, 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 let's go. <laughs> yeah, no, I, but I think to, to your point, Mitch, I think also, you know, you look at it. I think the first goal in this game is so critical. Just oh, God. not even first 20 minutes, please. Not even not even just for like the actual result of it, but just the psyche of it. Because, Absolutely. you know, let, let's say they come out. Let's say it's Estevez to one of the midfielders and then Max scores a banger, his first goal. Or let's say it's something on a set piece. Either of those, the Raps are going to be like, OK, exhale. We're OK. Yes. Atlanta has to come out of their shell. That leaves so much more space in behind for my. Michael Barrios. Atlanta scores first is like, all right, banks of four guys. Dude. Like, let's just have them. And then at that point, you know, they're going to force it to where it's going to have to be long balls into the box. And, and again, you're counting on, you know, if every single one of those balls has a, we know, 1% chance of being a goal, you need a hundred of those in order to actually score. And so it's low quality. So I think it's the, I think the first goal will have a tremendous effect on the psyche of the Rapids either way. And also on the game state and even more so, like those two will combine with each other. So if the goal is scored by Atlanta, it's a bad psyche for the Rapids and sets them up for the worst game state based on how they like to play. If the Rapids score first, it's advantage to them psychologically. It's advantage to them in terms of how that changes the game tactically. Looking at, I just pulled up DraftKings now because because I wanted to look at some goal scorer props. None up yet. So, you know, we'll update that maybe in the mini pod later this week. But first goal of the game, Rapids minus 145. They do DraftKings at least the odds guys are expecting the Rapids to come out and set the tone. Mm-hmm. Would you? Is that what you're? I mean, how do you walk me through the first twenty minutes of this game? How, what are you expecting to play out? The Rapids come out energetically. I think C thirty eight and the crowd is trying to be the twelfth man absolutely on the field. And I think the Rapids come out with energy. The movement off the ball when they have the ball and when they're out of possession is better. I think the pressing is better, particularly in midfield and on the center backs. Um, and I think Diego Rubio comes out, you know, with a metaphorical knife between his teeth, ready to do something. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And so I think there's, I think there's a chance for the Rapids to try and swarm them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think so too. I think some I would expect a response almost similar to the first 20 minutes of the game against Portland on Thanksgiving. I like that. What uh, starting 11 wise, do you think we get the same starting 11? 
Um, in terms of, <laughs> there's been so many of them. I sure. guess the. Um, so I guess that you know that's Jonathan Lewis. Or I guess he he started in the uh, second league. Yeah, so I think and then I think the back line writes itself. Yep. Yarbrough and goal left to right for the five: Estevez, Trusty, Wilson, Abubakar, Rosenberry. So nothing changing there. Nothing changes. Don't there. change what's mostly working. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think in the um, I think I think up top I would go Rubio Barrios because I would want Lewis as Absolutely. a substitute. Yep. I think there's a question of I don't know if this is a, a doubt by Robin Frazier, but I just think the fact that like. Brian Acosta hadn't been with the team was trying to integrate him in. Yeah. So Brian Acosta having another full week with the team, does that work him into the starting 11? Uh, and then he's also in a way competing with Max for that as well. I right. think you want to be on the front foot for this game. So I personally would go K Max and then um, price. I would plan Brian Acosta, assuming the Rapids are winning in the second half would be my first midfield sub. Okay. I think my first attacking sub would probably be Lewis on for Barrios. And then I'm not sure that there'd be a, a defensive sub to make. I mean, maybe if it's, if Estevez has just run himself into the ground and you're trying to see <laughs> out the game, maybe a Steven Bader, sure. Sure. Or bringing in, bringing in Drew Moore and then go properly to four at the back, maybe. Okay. But, um, you know, and then I think if you needed something attacking wise, other than Lewis, you'd probably go Mosquito. Cause like you said, I thought he was decent given the situation. Energy. With LAFC. Yeah. Energy. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the way to go. I don't think it, like so far overall in the last three games, I'd suggest it's hard to say that the Rabs aren't in the right position to be successful. Mm -hmm. They just haven't been successful. Yes. Right. And so is this the game where being in the right position leads to those chances? We'll see. Give me a final score prediction. I've been... <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot. Put, Put me, me on the spot. Put me on the spot. Um, I'll. Uh, Joseph Martinez is. Uh, he didn't look that great though. I. Uh, I believe in this team and, and, and their mentality and everything. I think the Rapids win this game one 0 Whoa, whoa! I like that. And you think it's a set piece goal that goes in? Uh, mm, if it's not a set piece, it's one of Max or Mark Anthony K doing something for the run of play. I love that man. Uh, Dev Machine says. Two two draw, two two draw. I don't know. I don't like that. Sorry, Dev. I want to win. I mean, I think it's, I'm saying think two it's one. I'm saying two one. They will go up one nil. Atlanta will level. We'll get one late. That's my prediction. All right. Both teams to score minus one fifty five. Yes, take it. Um, not because I doubt our defense. I just think that this game's going to open up a little bit. You hear? You want to throw in a prediction? Uh, three one rapids. Three, three one, one rapids. <laughs> Whoa! I love it. Yeah, here so brings goals. the sauce so many with the goals. rapids, dude. <laughs> Let's go, Burgundy Kool Aid for Yaya, dude. I love it. Um, last thing I wanted to plug, uh, we got a message from one of the players uh, on the Rapids under seventeen. They are playing on Saturday, uh, I believe at. Let me look at here. 1230 on the turf fields at Dick's Sporting Goods Park. I know a lot of people are headed out for the C38 tailgate. Um, home opener. You know, everyone wants to go hang out in the parking lot, crush some beers, eat some hot dogs. Who wouldn't? Um, go in a little early and and, and watch the young guys. Um, they're playing Real Colorado. That's like their rivalry from what I can tell. Um, I actually knew some guys in the Real system when I was in high school. Uh, but... You know, come support the guys. They, uh, it's free. You can just walk up and watch them. I don't know if there's, it's, I mean, I'm not saying go scout them. I don't know how much you can pull out of it, but you can definitely go support them and go cheer for them. And, and, um, yeah. I mean, have you ever, have you ever been to one of these matches before a game? Um, I've been to them in the past, not anything since COVID happened and everything. Sure. I mean, it, it looks like a training ground game in terms of how many people sure. are there and yeah. how you can hear everything. But I mean, you know, it's, a, uh, um, you know, these U 17s have been good. What you've seen from the Rapids Academy, there is a player on that U 17 team right now who will sign a homegrown contract for the Colorado Rapids. You heard it here. Yeah. Go check them out. Support them. Look, I think the biggest thing, and especially as, as DNVR, and, you know, not even speaking on that big of a level, just me personally getting into this MLS coverage. Uh, there's definitely a lot of community around this club. Um, C38 does a great job fostering that. But I think part of that is supporting the club from top to bottom. And if the under 17s are literally just down the way from the parking lot, 
Go catch them. Go see what they're yeah. doing. If you're not waving flags and lighting <laughs> off flares at a Bang U14 the boom, boom, game boom, 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 at 10 a.m., <laughs> are you even a Rapids fan? Yeah, come on, bro. Do you even pid? Do you even Hashtag pid? do you even pid. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for us this week here on DNVR. Do you want to plug anything real quick? Yeah, uh, yeah, folks. Follow me on Twitter at LWS Matt Pollard. Uh, Rabbi and I are podcasting tonight, so if you've got any at last minute Ask HCHLs, tweet that at Rapids ninety six podcast. Um, and I'll be at the match on Saturday. Yeah, we'll be hanging out in the press box for sure. Um, I think you described holding the high line perfectly to Super Producer Kale. It is soccer homework, and do your homework for this game. It will definitely <laughs> help you watch it. Look, I, I mean that makes it sound bad. It is full of information. This is how you learn more about it is listening to these guys when they really get into it. So check them out. Make sure you check out DNVR Rapids. Follow us on Twitter. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Come down to the DNVR bar. Get your Rapid shirt. I ordered some really cool merch today, which I won't say what it is specifically, but it is something we've never done before at DNVR, and you're going to love it. So make sure to check that out. Follow me on Twitter at underscore underscore Mitchell James. Follow Yahir at Yahir G. Vasquez. And we'll see you next week.